uh, and ask the question, what Bible did Jesus use? And, of course, when he went in, he was, the Bible says he's 12 years old. And mom and dad, they, they, they all went down to, to the synagogue, and, and they left. They didn't take Jesus with them. They, you know how a bunch of kids just get together and all day meeting at church, and, and so they just, oh, I bet he was playing, and they, we just went right off. You know, you get to talking. We had one, ev one evangelist, Dr. Paul Martin, I don't remember, know if any of you remember him, that came to our church, and he had five five children, five boys and one girl, a four boys, four boys and a girl, all boys. Okay, I thought well later they got the daughter. Later the baby, they had a little girl. But anyway, they drove off, and the old, the old white church building that we started in, you just locked it with a padlock on the outside. The church was built without locks on the doors, and so they somebody had put a padlock there to lock the doors. And so we were locking up the church. Here comes that big Oldsmobile station wagon cruising in there and blowing the horn, flashing the lights, blowing the horn, flashing the lights. And they had left their front, on the front row of the bench, he sound asleep. Still was. <laughs> he was still laying right in there sound asleep. And so Jesus was left by his parents. And guess what they found him doing? Studying the Word of God. Would the leaders, the, the religious leaders there, and it talks about some hard questions. But now, you, are you in Matthew now, Matthew chapter 1? Let's go right there just for a moment, and I want to just, we're not going to, if you, if you read the New Testament, you're reading the Old Testament. Just rewritten, explained. It's, it enlightens us what the old, so is it necessary? You better believe it is. The Old Testament is, I mean, that's, that's the word of God. And, and that when Paul said, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. What was he talking about? He's writing back to the church at Rome. What book did he preach out of? What, what is he calling the word of God? Where does your faith come from? The Old Testament. And the fulfillment of it, and now we include the New Testament, but I don't think Paul was living when they canonized the Bible. I, I think he'd gone on to be with the Lord by then, and uh, matter of fact, he said he finished his course. And, uh, and, and what an amazing thing just to think about how important the Old Testament is. And, and it's just, Eileen and I were talking about it, and I think it's Dr. R.G. Lee, he preached at Tennessee Temple, and and he had uh, beautified the teachings of the Lord. It's a sermon more than he was coming to preach. What's his famous sermon? Payday someday. And so I got to hear him preach it twice. The last time he was 91 years old. And he preached it over a thousand times. And I mean, Highland Park Baptist Church, there were hundreds of people down front to be saved, to make sure they were saved. Even though it was a sermon that he had preached over and over, God blessed that sermon. And, uh, but I heard him say, don't miss the scarlet thread that runs through your Bible. Talking about the blood of Christ and the person of Christ. But notice how the New Testament starts. And it calls the Bible the book. I, I, until I started this, until past, Pastor Springer asked me to kind of work on what the New Testament has to say about the Old Testament. And I came, I thought, I never noticed that. The book, that's what it's called, right, right here. Uh, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And so it gives the genealogy, I think it's 28, uh, tw 28 things all through here. And, and if you look, and if, as you look at it, it su summarizes the time, the timeline of the first 16 verses there of the, of the timeline of the Old Testament. It's talked about here. It's all summarized in these first 16 verses. And, and then he, he takes and uses the scripture. Uh, now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother uh, was on this wise when, as his mother Mary was in spouse to Joseph, 
she before they came together was found with child of Holy Ghost. Notice how Joseph, her husband being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and uh, saying, Joseph, thy son of David, fear not to take Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a child. A son, excuse me, a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sin. And then notice verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she'll bring. I believe if you look back in the Old Testament, you'll find that. And so the angel used the book to comfort Joseph. You find in Luke that the, the angel Gabriel uh, speaking to Mary and, and John the Baptist's mom, uh, she, she, the, the angel had come to her and told her that she'd not be barren, that she'd bear a son and he'd be the forerunner of Jesus. And guess what the angel did? Just as he did when he came to Joseph, he gave them promises from the Old Testament. This is what's happening. Mary is, had been picked to be the mom of the Savior of Israel, and from Israel, the whole world. And the, the angels quote Scripture, and it's recorded in the Bible. Thank God for Dr. Luke, as he recorded it in much, much Scripture. Uh, he, as he comforted Mary, you, you read here in, in Luke chapter 1, and moving down, uh, and, and when she saw him, she struggled, talking about Gabriel, uh, and as at his sayings, and cast her mind, what manner of salutation should this be? He's just told her that she's highly favored, and she's the virgin. God has picked you out. Now, they say she's probably 15 years old, you know, somewhere around that. I wasn't, out of, I wasn't back there. And uh, some people think when I say something like that, they think, oh, you knew her too, huh? No, no, I didn't know her too. And, uh, but the, he, he talks about this, and then he begins to inform her that she's the one that Isaiah prophesied about. Listen to some of the promises that he made. Uh, and, and talked about him reigning over the house of David. Verse 31 says, And thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus, for he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God <coughs> shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. And I with Mary would say the same things. How shall... How shall this be, seeing I've known no man? Well, he goes back, and you go back, and you find Isaiah seven fourteen. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, Daniel chapter 2, 44. And the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall, uh, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be uh, not left to others, but it shall break to pieces. Talking about the great, the stone that destroys the... Uh, the ten toes of the of that statue, and it shall stand forever. And then over in chapter 7, verse 14 of Daniel, and there was given him dominion and glory in the kingdom. That's what, that's what Gabriel's talking about. And so the word of God was used, the Old Testament was used to comfort Mary. And then undoubtedly, Mary and Elizabeth, I don't know, I think, well, Paul writes to Timothy and says, your mom and your granny taught you the word of God. Well, these young ladies, and I don't think Elizabeth was as young as Mary, but these kin folks, they were well versed in the scriptures. You just read the last part of chapter one. John leaped in a room when Mary walked in, and Mary said, "I'm carrying my Savior." She already put his faith in him before he's ever born. And boy, they got they had they had a spell. They must have been Baptists because they named their son John the Baptist. And uh, no, I mean, they just they just had a great time of glorifying and quoting the Word of God. And what were they quoting? Well, the Old Testament. 
that's exactly what they were quoting. Uh, and so we'll just run through some things, and then I'll summarize it for you. But the Old Testament is called the Law and the Prophets. Uh, and that, Jesus used this, the Sermon on the Mount, is just an a, a exposition of the Old Testament. Ye have said, but I say unto you. Ye have said is tradition. It's how they had twisted the word of God. And then he says, but I say unto you. And that's the word of God. And he just sorted it right. He just read the verse. Faith cometh by hearing, not by believing, but by hearing. You can witness to an atheist. This is a powerful book. You don't, I, I, I just... I told, I told somebody one day, I said, I'm never talking to another Jehovah's Witness. Well, that's dumb. Now, I'm not saying get in a fuss with them and don't invite them into your home. Don't speed them on their way. Don't pay them money and buy their magazines. But if you have opportunity and you knock on their door, you all do knock on doors, I found out, and I like that. Keep doing it. That's what the Bible commands. That's our great commission. You can lead a Jehovah's Witness to the Lord. I had one of my cousins said, I was visiting my Aunt Aubrey, and, uh, and she was in a hospital at Riverdale. Uh, I think it was called Clayton General back then. I, can't, I think that was the name of it. And so Bud came in, and he said, Ronnie, I sure am glad to see you. He said, there's a fellow was at my garage he had he had he had, he was a mechanic he repaired basically fords but uh but it, it, he he could fix anything that had an engine in it and some things that didn't have engines but uh that he he was just a christian man and he said there's a man standing in standing in front of the garage talking to me and said he was i'm working on his car and it's on jack's and I'm showing him what's wrong, and he's standing looking over the front of the car, and there's another car parked behind him. And so one of the old fellows drove up and said, instead of him putting his foot on the brakes, he put his foot on the accelerator and crashed through the door, hit the car, knocked it off the jacks, and pinned this man that I'm talking about, pinned him between the cars. And this is back, Mama was still living, Aunt Aubrey was living. So, and so it's been back in the early 80s probably. And uh, and so I said, yeah, I'll go talk with him. Now, my Sunday school lesson, I had just basically said, don't waste your time with Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, just don't don't, don't bid them Godspeed. And and uh, and I said, they they just got their minds made up that they don't believe the word of God. Something along those lines. Well, I go in and just like in the movies, here's this guy in a body cast. I'd never seen one in person, you know. He's got, they got the thing with the little thing that you pull up and down, and that's what the kids run in, and oh, you know, and you move him around, but he, they was having to readjust him. He's got an arm up like this, and he's in a cast from here down. And I'd never seen anybody like that, and I, I, I learned a lot of things when I first started in the ministry, and some of them just scared me to death, and just had to trust God. And here I am, and he's laying there, and he said, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, I asked him had, if I could take the Bible and read, read some words of Scripture with him and pray with him. He said, I don't want to go to hell. And I said, you don't have to. You don't have to. I said, boy, I just, I just shifted gears. And I said, the Bible says. And I, John uh, not Romans, I think I probably went through the Romans road with him. And boy, when I read, if you believe in your heart, he just started praying. He just started praying the sweetest prayer. Asked God to save him tears. He couldn't even wipe his tears out of his eyes. I had to take a towel and wipe tears out of his eyes for him. And he was his happy tears. He's in a body cast, remember? And we talked for a little while and he said, Preacher said, I didn't even believe there's a hell so I got smashed between those cars and said I could feel the fires coming up around my feet. Bub started praying for me. 
I'm witnessing to him. I think he's going to die. I mean, if anybody looks like they're going to die, he looks like he's going to die. And I didn't know. I had no idea. I, I preached that God's in control, but he placed me right there. And so there I am with the word of God. And he says, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't believe in hell. Well, before he told me that, his wife walked in. He says, honey, listen to what this man's got to say. He said, tell her what you just told me, preacher. said, she needs to be saved too. Boom, just like that, another convert. Here comes two kids in. Children, listen to this man. He's got something to tell you. I went through it again. Two more, four people saved just within 30 minutes. I'm standing there, and, I, and we had a prayer of praise. Thank the Lord. I, I told him, asked him where he lived, and recommended him a church and needed to be baptized. You know, just kind of what you do now. And this is a verse. And I turned to walk, and he said, Preacher, you know, I didn't believe in hell. And I said, what? He said, I've been a Jehovah's Witness 25 years. There goes my Sunday school lesson right out the window. So I went back and, and taught, I retaught that lesson. I said, hey, it doesn't matter whether they believe the Bible or not. It's hearing the Bible. The Bible does the work. The Bible does the work. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing what? The book. The book, the scriptures. And so, as we think about it, the Old Testament is called the Law and the Prophets. That's what Jesus called it in Matthew 5. This is a Sermon on the Mount. I could use others, but this is a great verse. Verse 17. Think not I am come to destroy the Law and the Prophets. That's what he said. Think not that I am come to destroy the Law and the Prophets. Why would he say that? Because the Pharisees, the religious crowd, they was already saying he's trying to, he's blessed. I mean, they started out after him from the beginning, from the get-go. Herod tried to kill him. I mean, why would the, the religious leaders tell Herod where the wise, for the wise men where to go? They knew the scripture said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. They told them that, but they didn't go. And so they just started this hateful ministry and, and so here he says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. Well, it hadn't come back yet. So it's still very practical. The Old Testament is still very practical, very usable. So that's the Bible that Jesus used. And uh, what did the Bible, what, what Bible did the apostles use? Well, on the day of Pentecost, all you have to do is read. I mean, boy, when Peter and the rest of them cut loose, it's just Scripture. Old Testament. That's what they were preaching. And uh, then John later... There in the last chapter of John, I think, well, John 21, verse 24, this is the apostle John, and this, and this is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they were to be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself couldn't contain the books that should be written. But he fulfilled the Bible is what John's saying. That's exactly what he did. And so the Bible is called the book. The Bible is called the law and the prophets. The Bible is called, when I say the Bible right now, the word of God, the, the Old Testament, it's called the scriptures. You start and think about the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading the scriptures. That's what the Bible says. He's reading the scriptures. Now, uh, the story is that he arose and, and there's an Ethiopian eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning, sitting in his chapter, reading Isaiah the prophet. He's, he's reading Isaiah 53. 
is what he's reading. And you look there in, in Acts 8, uh, and I'm reading now in 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself unto the chair, uh, to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him and heard him reading, uh, read the prophet Isaiah and said, Philip said to the Ethiopian, Understandest thou what thou readest? Isn't that a neat thing? What was he reading? The Old Testament. And, and so he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So you see a man. Now you see some man. And verse 32, Acts eight thirty-two, And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb before the shearers, so opened he not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? Uh, whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? You have a man, some man, and now you got some other man. That other man is Jesus. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Isn't that the neatest thing? It's, I'd say the Old Testament's still relevant. It's still relevant. And, uh, and, and so we need to understand that. And then... When Paul wrote to Timothy, he, and you, you used this this morning, uh, he wrote to him, and this is what he said about the scriptures. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is the word of truth that he's talking about? Now he's writing back to Timothy, and he's telling him, what's he telling him to study? The letter that he just wrote him? No, he's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the, old, the Bible that they had at that time was the Old Testament. And he says now, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what Jesus did. He rightly divided the word of truth. That's what the apostles did when they stood and preached. When they stoned Stephen, he started with creation to, to Abraham. He went all the way up and he said, and you've crucified him. Well, you know, that's such comforting words. They just started stoning him. Can you imagine being so mad at something? Now, I've seen little kids bite. Uh, whew, I, I've seen them bite each other. I've never seen grown men. Well, if you watch Saturday Night Wrestling, you might see it one or two times of it. But I don't, oh, my goodness, I can see my mama and her friends and that, Mr. Matt, Miss Maddie and Mr. Glenn's little round television, the only television in the neighborhood and they'd all gather over and watch Saturday night wrestling. They on the edge of the chairs. And uh, he's biting him. I, what is, I don't go too far off track here now, but I'm about to. But grown people biting each other, gnashing, that means taking chunks of his flesh out of him simply because he picked the book up and said, this is, this is him. This is Jesus. He takes away the sins of the world. What a, what a sweet testimony he had. And they stoned him to death. And now you've got Philip. He's talking to this eunuch. And now Paul's writing back to young Timothy who has been with him. He's trained him. Now he's about to be a pastor. And he's telling him, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. And then from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now it's called the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What does the Old Testament do? It points you to the Savior. All Scripture, now what did they have? All they had was the Old Testament. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God, 
And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And the word perfect and truly, that's an old, old English word, truly. And uh, it means complete completeness. The word perfect is you use this morning. It means complete. It means it's, it's all there, but then it double it does a double whammy on it. It comes over with truly, and it says it's completely completed. That's what it's saying, and it's and that's talking about the Old Testament. And but now we realize that we have these books of the New Testament now, the Gospels, the Person of Christ. We see four different views of Him. We see the Acts of the Apostles. We've got a history book there to learn how our early church started. And then once those churches are started, most of the epistles are written back by Paul. John wrote some. Like I said this morning, can you imagine being the oldest apostle alive and then the apostle Paul out of due time? He saw Jesus in a vision and said he'd come and visited with him. So that qualified him to be an apostle. He wrote John a letter. That sweet letter of Ephesians. Paul wrote that and it was scripture. Why? Because he's telling them what the Old Testament said. He wrote Peter a note undoubtedly. Peter said, that Paul is deep. <laughs> Excuse me, that's a Whitlock rendition of it. But boy, he's deep. boy. But some things are hard to be understood. Now this is what others... Over the, over the centuries have had to say about the Bible. No, nobody ever outgrows Scripture. The book widens and deepens with our ears. years. Charles Spurgeon. Elizabeth Eggett said, The Word of God, I think, is as a straight edge which shows up our crookedness. We can't really tell how crooked our thinking is until we line it up with the straight edge of the Scripture. And then Helen Keller, unless we form the habit of going to the Bible in bright moments as well as in trouble, we cannot fully respond to the consolations because we lack equilibrium between light and darkness. And then Martin Luther, the Bible is a cradle wherein Christ is laid. Isn't that powerful? And then A.W. Tozier, I like to read behind him, the word of God, well understood and religiously obeyed, is the shortest route to spiritual perfection. We must not select a few favorite passages for these, uh, to the exclusion of others. Nothing less than the whole Bible can make a whole Christian. And then Mark Twain said this in sarcasm. Most people are bothered by those passages of scripture they don't understand. But the passages that bother me are those that I do understand. Now, he was not a renowned Christian. He was somebody that really mocked you for being a Christian. And uh, he was probably considered an agnostic. President Abraham Lincoln said this, I'm profitably engaged in reading the Bible, taking all this book that you can by reason and by the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. It's the best book which God has given to man. And then John Wesley, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safely on that happy shore. God himself has consented, uh, condescended to teach the way. For the very end, he came from heaven. For this very end, he came from heaven. He has written down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. I have it. Here's the knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. And that's what just some, a few people. Now, let me close with this. The miracle book. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable. It's written on three different continents. Uh, God spoke to 40 plus different men and you write a part and you write a part 
it's one we call the Bible. It contains 66 books, one book. You know, you have the encyclopedias from A to Z, and they, they like this on the shelf. Well, we've got a concise encyclopedia of what God wants us to know. And they, they, the Spirit of God has put them together to make one harmonious, harmonious, miraculous book in which no human being has ever found one mistake. Never. That's the most amazing thing to me. I, I went to school. I graduated in 1961. And so whatever that does, it makes me back in the 40s when I started, just the late 40s. We prayed all the way, all the way up, got in high school. We got some new teachers right out of college. We stopped praying. One of them was a science teacher. One of my favorite teachers, as a matter of fact. And he just put a question out there about evolution. Were we really created? Can you prove that? And then he, just, that's the first time I'd ever heard evolution. And I'm thinking, what? But somehow, as a young, inexperienced, not not live very long, ninth grade, caused me to question the Word of God. Just, just a smidgen. Just a smidgen. He didn't say that we had evolved. They couldn't have taught that. They'd have got kicked out of school. They'd, they would have been fired as teachers at Fett County. I would have never believed that the Bible wouldn't be allowed in school. I just, I couldn't believe that. I, I remember when they were collecting signatures to take prayer out of school. 5,000. And they took prayer out of school. Well, as a school teacher, and I taught some 30 plus years, and <laughs> I've got some more school teachers sitting here too, you can't take prayer out of school if you give a test like I give. <laughs> I guarantee you they're going to pray. And uh, I had to pray also. I mean, uh, many times, many times I had to ask God for the answers and not the answers to math questions, but just how to deal with a young person. I love it. I absolutely enjoy them. I've never, I, I won't, I, their whole life is before them. And I, I'm just, I stand amazed at what God's doing with some of our students. And it just amazes me. And, uh, and my wife taught them and they come up to us and you know, a person changes from the third grade. Their physical appearance changes from the third grade 40 years later coming up. Oh, Mrs. Whitlock! You know, and, and then they look over at me. They don't even, they don't even remember me. You know, I, I was that mean old math teacher that made them learn how to tell time on the clock. I wouldn't let them put digital clocks in. I was deaf on digital clocks. I wanted a round clock with 360 degrees in it, and I wanted my students to know how many degrees the second hand moved every time it tick, tick, tick. How many degrees does it move? Well, it's pretty simple if you stop and think about it. And how long does it take the second hand to go all the way around? You ever think about that? Not a, di a digital clock can't teach you that. You've got to have a round clock in your classroom. You've got to have a thermometer with a with the red line or blue line up and down that thing and have a minus sign on the bottom and, and a plus sign on the top. And that When you come to teaching numbers, our number system's like God. It has no end. To the left is negative. To the right is positive. You go down, it's negative. You go up, it's positive. And there it is right there in the thermometer. I can just bring it. You better pay attention to what I'm teaching you about these negative numbers. You'll get cold one day and not know why. Just simple. The Bible's that simple. It's just that simple. Uh, it's a book that breathes, is what one, one pastor said. It breathes. Can you, have you ever read it and feel the breath of the Spirit of God on you? I mean, it just, there's just something that just has, oh, I, you've read it a hundred times and you say to yourself, oh, I've never seen that before. It's just like the word, the book. How many times have I read through the New Testament and never realized it's called the book? The Old Testament's called the book. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ. That's, 
That's what the Old Testament is. And so it's a book that breathes. It's a book that bleeds. You open its pages and it's stained with the blood of Calvary's lamb. Eve, one day there's going to be a son. You're going to have a son. Satan's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise Satan's head. You know what that is? That's the promise of Calvary. That's the promise of our Savior coming. And, and oh, how important it is. It's a book of love and of light. It led me out of darkness, out of hell, into heaven. The Bible, that's, that's the way out. Now, I'm glad to have the Word of God. Alexander Duff was a missionary to India. I don't know if you've heard it or not. Brother Terry might have told you. Brother Ben might have. But he was aboard a ship in the old days. And in the storm at sea, the boat sank. And he had all his books, including his Bible. All were lost. Alexander Duff was one of the few rescued. And later on shore, he saw a little brown object floating on the waves. And he waded out and picked it up. And it was his Bible. Closed with a little metal clasp. He hugged it to his bosom. Waded to shore and said, of all the books I've ever owned, this one is the most important of all. And then with nothing but the Bible, he went on into India to tell the wondrous story of Jesus. And how important the Bible is. The first time the word written is used in the Bible. Have you ever thought about that? You, I like to do things like that. Just look it up and... and and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount Sinai two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now, he wrote the first book with his finger. And then he began to entrust men to pin it down. Exodus thirty-two sixteen, and the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tablets. And just as the Ten Commandments was written by the finger of the living God, he wants to write them in your heart and my heart. He wants them written in your heart and my, your mind and your uh, heart. 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Remember now the Old Testament's there, but listen to the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church at Corinth. For as much as ye are manifest manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in a table of stones, but in a fleshly tablet, a table of the heart. Isn't that neat? He, he wants to write on our hearts and write in our minds. And no longer an external standard divinely Engraved in stone by the finger of God, but an internal conviction inscribed in the heart by the Spirit of God. Hebrews ten sixteen, And this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their heart, and in their mind will I write them. That's in the New Testament. He says, I'm going to write the Old Testament in your heart and mind. What a remarkable thing. The writings of God in my heart, in your heart, in my mind, your mind, it's been accomplished because Christ came not to destroy, but to fulfill the law. Remember where I started? Now, with the law of God in our hearts, we've become an epistle of God, known and read of all men. That's what 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and your epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. And it's most important that the writings read true and clear through our lives. It needs to line up with the Old Testament, which is explained in the New Testament. And so as we go through there and study those big words like concupiscence and lasciviousness and uncleanliness, there's some other, other big words about called righteousness. It's not what we don't understand. It's what we plainly understand that God wants to deal with us about. 
And he'll put something in your heart. And I remember a day when I realized, and I shared some of it with you this morning, for me to live for Christ, I had to be right with everybody. And so immediately when I prayed, certain people come to mind immediately, like my wife, my children, (laughs) friends. And so one by one, as God gave me opportunity, I've started going to them and would you forgive me? I would name what God had put in my heart where I had been cross with my wife or I would treated her wrong and I asked her to forgive me. She went to the same meeting, and she said, oh, I've got some things I want to talk to you about. So about a day later, about a day later, I mean, it was the sweetest thing. And then we began to talk to the children and and talk with them and tell them that we'd given them to God, and we wanted them to be something for the Lord. And I I told them, I said, just write out anything that I have promised you and I didn't fulfill I thought, you know, maybe a couple of things. Ron wrote, he's not here, I'll tell on him. I won't tell on you. That boy had a page and a half, one line notebook paper, son. He had a page and a You know what? It was all correct. Some of it I couldn't do any longer. Some of it had happened when he was four and five years old. Yeah. I just had to ask him to forgive me. And let's, let's, do, let's do this and this. And so we've tried to keep a short list. <laughs> Needless to say, we've tried to keep a short list. But I just begin as a word of God, as a preacher. I wasn't a preacher then. And as God began to work in my life, all of a sudden sermons became very important. I listened to them. I'd take notes. I'd go to the altar. I'd pray. I remember going to hear Dr. Lee Robertson. I'd heard of him, these missionaries, Terry Arp. I tried to win him to the Lord. He's sitting in our Sunday school class, sitting up by himself. We inviting all these people. Here's a total stranger. I said, this one's mine. I'm going to mark him up. That's how I met Pastor Terry Arp. He was missionary, a missionary Terry Arp. Never seen him before in my life. He let me witness to him, and then his only Brother Terry Arp can do, son, he'd give me a sharp witness and ask me if I was saved and how I knew. Boy, he ground me in. I mean, I sure was glad I knew I was saved and I had a verse I could base it on. I mean, boy, he just, whoo. I thought, and he said, he handed me a prayer card. He said, I'm Terry Arp, missionary to Africa. We're going to be here presenting our program today. And I thought, he had not got one of them little hats on, you know. He's not in khaki. He's in a suit. That can't be a missionary. He was, and we've been friends for years. One of the first missionaries our church started supporting. Oh, I always love to have him come because he'd sort y'all out, son. (laughs) Brother Whitlock, I don't see how you pastor this crowd. You know who he's talking about? His brothers and sisters and their little kids. We had such a sweet time. I love him so. Pray for him. I do. But we made things right as God spoke to our hearts. We still do. Why? Because of what the Bible says. The book.